siempre digo a la gente que es muy fácil recordar cómo me llamo. Solamente pensar en Tomás Whisky. I have two tasks here uh, at this podium. One is to uh, offer an opening prayer and then to offer some reflections about Monsignor Walsh. So let us begin with the prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the image of the Holy Family, Mary, Joseph, and the child Jesus, recalls the plight of all refugees and all displaced persons uprooted from their homelands because of tyranny and political violence. At the same time, this image of the Holy Family reminds us that Jesus, whom we acclaim as the Son of God, made flesh, a man like us in everything but sin, was also like the children of Pedro Pan, for Jesus himself was also a refugee child. He spent time in Egypt, united with his parents, and despite his exile, he did not lose his identity. He did not lose the sense of who he was. We ask today your blessings upon these refugee children, now grown, with children and grandchildren of their own. May their experience remind us that the human person created by God requires conditions worthy of human life in order to flourish. And those conditions include food and shelter, the love of a family, but they also include freedom and opportunity. May the children of Pedro Pan bear witness by the lives they have lived and continue to live of what people can accomplish when they live their lives in freedom, when they live their lives committed to the truth about God and the truth about the human person. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, let me put my own uh, being here into context, perhaps. In 1995, I was appointed uh, by Archbishop Favalora to be the successor of Brian Walsh as the president of Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Miami. Uh, when I took that job, I acknowledged that I had some very uh, big shoes to fill. And when I took over from Monsignor Walsh, I was comforted in the realization that Monsignor was very happy that it was me who was chosen to be his successor at Catholic Charities. And I, I believe I try to continue his, his work of advocacy, his work of being present in the community and of being the voice for the voiceless in this community. That was in 1995. And I took Monsignor Walsh's place, but nobody could take that place, but I uh, assumed the position that he had. And then in 2010, some 16 months ago, June 1st, I became the fourth Archbishop of Miami, thus succeeding Archbishop Coleman Carroll, who also was a key figure in the uh, life of this community and the life of Pedro Pan, because it was he who enabled my senior Walsh to do the work that he did uh, in the Catholic Welfare Bureau, now known as Catholic Charities, but also giving him the freedom and the confidence that he placed in him to undertake this unprecedented and, and a bit risky endeavor of, 
of welcoming to Miami and to the United States some 14,000 children. Now, when the Pedro Pan uh, operation began, I was in the fourth grade in 1960. I was in the fourth grade in Lake Worth, Florida, in a Catholic school. And in that Catholic school, I don't remember that we had, in the fourth grade anyway, Spanish class. But I do remember that the sister who taught the class taught us early in the year to pray the Our Father and the Hail Mary in Spanish. And I remember sitting in that classroom one day when the principal of the school and the pastor came by to visit the classroom and they brought with them two young kids. I think they were a little bit older than us fourth graders, but they were children from Cuba. More than likely, Pedro Pan. And uh, you could see in their eyes a bit of apprehension and a bit of uncertainty. And you could also uh, sense that the reason that the pastor and sister were bringing them around the classrooms was to kind of reintroduce them to something normal. Because what is more normal for a child than a classroom? And as they stood at the front of the class, sister said to us, stand up and let us pray together. And then the whole class began to pray, Padre Nuestro que estás en el cielo. And these kids at that time did not speak any English, and, but you could almost see in their eyes some of the apprehension and some of the uh, nervousness that they had being on display in front of a class dissipate as they heard us pray in, in their own language. 22 months later, I was in the sixth grade. And in the sixth grade, I can remember, as a child of that age, seeing President Kennedy on TV with the photographs of the Cuban, uh, the Russian missiles, Russian missile bases in, in Cuba. And I can remember the October crisis. And what is clear in my mind, what I remember most clearly about the October crisis was my class, again with another sister as our teacher. We were all on our knees praying the rosary next to our desk, praying the rosary so that the Soviet Union would turn their ships around and avert uh, a nuclear uh, holocaust. So that's my context to Pedro Pan and to the Cuban exile community. Later on, I went to the high school seminary, and in that seminary, there were several of my classmates that were Pedro Pans. They were studying in the seminary, uh, learning English at the same time, and also uh, we were consciously aware that their parents were still in Cuba. In fact, one of these free, uh, one of these seminarians, his father was in prison in Cuba, and it was uh, in in that high school seminary that I began to learn Spanish uh, from the same children or young men, young boys, with me. In fact, I would speak to them in Spanish and they would speak to me in Spanish and that's how I was able to to learn Spanish uh, and I would go in the back of a classroom because we weren't allowed to have radios in the seminary but there was a classroom that had an old ham set and I could tune it into La Fabulosa. <laughs> Entonces si yo hablo español uh, no lo hablo muy bien porque aprendí de La Fabulosa como digo la gente. Si hablo como chusma, la culpa no tengo yo. Of course, when I was a seminarian, uh, Monsignor Walsh was 
almost a distant figure for us because he was such an important person in the archdiocese and we knew of, uh, of his work uh, and, uh, and we had great respect for him. Uh, and at the seminary we'd run into him every once in a while because he or another priest would come and visit those classmates of ours that were uh, Pedro Pons that were studying in the seminary. Uh, later on as I became a priest I had the opportunity to uh, get to know Monsignor Walsh a bit better and, and to work with him. Uh, a few years after I was ordained I began to learn Haitian Creole and uh, as I began to work with the Haitians I would be going to different places and, and people would say you're the Brian Walsh of the Haitians. <laughs> And I uh, began to appreciate uh, more and more what that meant and, and what a responsibility that had uh, been put on my shoulders uh, to be the Brian Walsh of the Haitians. But uh, he was uh, involved, as he was with uh, uh, the Cuban issues, he was also involved with the issue of the Haitian boat people when they were starting to come here and he was very much an advocate. And, and, he, uh, and he taught me also how to, to be an advocate and to be involved in the public square. Uh, too often uh, uh, our priests are a bit uh, reticent or shy about being uh, too involved in the public square. Uh, you know, I get uh, complaints every once in a while from some people that they never hear a priest talk about pro-life on sermons on Sunday, where they don't hear a priest talk about immigration reform on Sunday or other issues of human rights. But then I get complaints and letters when once in a while they do talk about those issues. But uh, the, the, the church has to be involved in the public square. And uh, that, I believe, is Monsignor Walsh's greatest legacy because he understood that. And he was not afraid to, to bring the voice of the church. Because we do have something to say. We have something to say because we are informed by a particular understanding of the human person. Of a particular understanding of the dignity of the human person. And as uh, men and women of faith, we have a responsibility and a right to, to share that understanding with our uh, fellow citizens. Now sometimes we get the uh, reaction or people uh, come back at us and say you're trying to impose your beliefs on others. And the truth is is that the church cannot impose itself on anyone because you know the church, the bishops and the priests and Catholic lay people generally do not carry blocks on their hips. So we don't have any means of imposing ourselves on others. But we can, as John Paul II used to say, we, have, we can and we must make our proposition, our proposal, of what constitutes the conditions worthy of human life. And uh, not to do so would be an abdication of our responsibility because it would be a failure of charity. The charity we owe our fellow men. Brian Walsh understood that, and so he was involved in, in many, many issues. The, the Cuban refugee crisis, he was involved with the issues of desegregation here in, in, uh, in South Florida. He was involved in, in social services and making the church a credible witness in that area of uh, uh, social welfare through Catholic Charities, Catholic Welfare Bureau, but also through health care, Catholic Health Services. The fact that here in the Archdiocese of Miami we have several nursing homes that take care of people, that we have uh, a Catholic hospice that uh, renders an incredibly beautiful service to families and their relatives in their last days. Uh, uh, is also the fact that there was even a Pedro Pan is because of this man of vision and 
a man of vision because he was always a man of faith. So we all are challenged to, uh, to remember him, but the best way we can remember him is to, uh, to keep his legacy alive by trying to uh, do the same uh, and, and imitate him in that, uh, that active presence in the public square as citizens of this country to witness to those conditions uh, worthy of human life, to witness to that unique perspective that we have because of our experience, but also because of our faith. So I stand before you as a successor of Brian Walsh and a successor of Archbishop Coleman Carroll. I ask you to pray for me that I will fill those very big shoes and prove to be their worthy successor. So thank you very much.